Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Autism Confidential, the podcast from the National Council on Severe Autism. I am Jill Escher. I'm your host today, and I am president of NCSA. And I'm back from vacation. Yes, I think you may have noticed that we haven't had any podcasts in recent weeks. And um, that's because summer was crazy, as I expressed before. Um, every summer is um, what we call Camp Mommy. <laughs> so I have a lot of uh, kid duties over the summer, in in addition to all my other work responsibilities. And um, then at the very end of August, I was lucky to get almost two weeks in Europe in Zurich and London and with no kids and um, got absolutely no work done, which is, I guess, the way it should be. And uh, now I'm back. So hopefully this fall, uh, we will get back to something like a normal schedule. So thank you to all the loyal listeners and watchers out there in autism land um, for putting up with us and for your patience and for um, hopefully tuning in for the remainder of the show this year. Now, what are we doing with this podcast? I'm extremely happy to have a return guest. Um, one of my absolute favorite, 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 favorite people in the world of autism, Dr. Alicia Halliday. Hello, Dr. Halliday. Hi, Jill. It's so nice to be on this podcast. I absolutely love NCSA and this podcast. And so I'm very happy and honored that you asked me to join today. Well, Alicia is um, a very uh, um, amazing figure in in the autism world. If you don't remember uh, her original podcast, she was one of our first podcast episodes. So you might kind of go back and maybe listen to that one to, to learn a little bit more about her. Um, but uh, she's very remarkable. I mean, she's been in this autism world, um, you know, as an advocate and a, a, a science officer for, I don't know, 20 years now? something like that. 20, yeah, a little yeah, more. About yeah, about 20 years. I don't want to age myself. <laughs> Although... um, she's currently chief science officer at Autism Science Foundation. She formerly worked at Autism Speaks and before that at NAR, um, the National Association for Autism Research, I believe it was called. And um, she's also a member of the, uh, the federal IACC, which is the Interagency Autism Coordinating Committee, the advisory committee at the NIH. Um, and um, she's also a published researcher, and she's also a mother of a daughter who's now a teenager. No, she is. is. She? Yes, oh, she's thirteen. She's... They turned oh, she's thirteen. Only a teenager. The... I know. I know. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Who? So who I know what it was. Like. I know what camp mom is like. <laughs> camp mom. Yeah. Yeah. It was. It was. Yeah. Um, control so, chaos. Control trying chaos. To but school has keep begun. People busy. I saw school the picture yesterday. of them going to school. Yes. <laughs> yes. And my school. daughter who has no social inhibitions whatsoever just gave me the finger. Yeah. <laughs> on her way out the door. Back to school. Well, <laughs> you know, at least, uh, at least she's back to school and hopefully yeah, doing she well. needed the, the, yeah, she needed, the, I learned some lessons this summer. She needs the structure and structure. she needs the the, the the repetition and the prediction and um, having, you know, kind of pulled things together all summer wasn't good for her. So, yeah, not the first person with autism to need structure and repetition. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> definitely. Exactly. Um, so today you're probably wondering, well, why do we have Alicia back? Well, I thought it would be really, really nice to do a little recap, a little review um, about advances or, you know, new findings in autism research. It's not something that we tend to talk a lot about on this podcast, but it's something that I personally am very, very passionate about and, um, that Alicia is absolutely expert on. So, um, let's go ahead, let's dive in and, um, let's start talking. We're going to go over, I'll, I'll give you a little heads up. Um, we're not going to talk about 20 different areas of research. We're going to talk about four <laughs> areas. <laughs> we're going to talk a little bit about genetics a little bit about prevalence, early intervention, and finally, these new studies on misinformation about autism on TikTok. Okay, so let's start uh, with, with genetics. So um, I was uh, I had a little back and forth with, with Alicia about a particular paper that came out, I believe, in June or July um, this year in PNAS. And it uh, 
looked mm -hmm. at, uh, it was the largest study to look at what are called multiplex families. So a family like mine, I have two kids with nonverbal autism, Sophie and Johnny. So I, I, mine is considered a multiplex family. Alicia, on the other hand, has one child with autism. So hers is considered a simplex family. And there've been a lot of papers, mostly on simplex families, you know, child, you know, where there's one child with autism. This particular study um, looked at multiplex families with two or more kids with ASD. And it was a big study. It looked at more than a thousand families with um, 1,836 subjects with ASD. And um, which apparently was double the size of a previous study on this type of cohort. It used the, it was agree, wasn't it, Alicia? Agree. So some of the, yes. So some of the families were agree families. So yeah. yeah. So they were, the other thing to realize about this study and things that we're finding out as studies go on and on is that some of those early families with agree probably and agree that were, and I remember when they were being followed, you know, 2000, let's just say 2005, um, that those families who were recruited, probably the presentation of their child with autism looks differently than a child that would be recognized as having autism now. So the agree that families they may be more might severe. be, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. that they probably are more severe. And in fact, that was documented in a different study at the Broad Institute that in fact, you know, if you look at different cohorts, as you go on the developmental milestones, like they, they were actually the, the missing of those milestones was more extreme in families like agree mm -hmm. who were collected years and years ago versus the ones that are collected by say, and I'm not trying to ding any one study or another by spark who's been recruiting more recently and uses a, um, you know, uses kind of a reported diagnosis. Do you have a diagnosis rather than going back? So there's that difference too. Um, but in any yeah. case, yes, sorry to interrupt. No, no, no. I, I think, you know, mo most people aren't science geeks like us and they don't know the difference <laughs> between, you know, one cohort from another. They don't know the difference between a Spark cohort and a Gree cohort, a Simon Simplex collection cohort. You know, it's all the same, you know, the missing cohort. There's so many yeah. different cohorts and people, you know, they, they don't spend their time reading about the characteristics of these cohorts. So, you know, it's, it's important when you read these papers to know like, what is the subject population? Um, but anyway, so uh, uh, what this paper, what the study was about is, is basically this. Aut and Alicia might not totally agree with me about this. I want to, that's we, okay. Which is no, okay. I don't, we respectfully no. disagree. Yeah. Okay. And I we probably agree more than than we disagree. So that's... that is definitely true. You know, autism's a big complex world. So he, here's the issue. Autism researchers have been looking and looking and looking and looking for the genetic causes of autism for the past, you know, 10 to 20 years. They've been doubling down their efforts. They've been you know, broadening, increasing their cohort size. They've been bringing new tools to it. They've been looking at more places in the genome. They're looking for different kinds of variants. They're looking at different levels of power for, to explain you know, the variants. They're looking desperately. There've been so many major studies using the most powerful tools available. And frankly, they are not finding a lot. And this is uh, what, what you what you find generally is that autism in these cohorts, from my reading of it, the autisms, about 14% of them or so can be explained by rare genetic variation. So far, 0% of autisms can be explained by what's called common variation. Common variation means basically harmless genetic variants that we all have, you know, more than 5% of us have that normally don't cause pathology. But maybe in some cases when those common variants get piled on will increase the risk for some pathology. You might see this, for example, in heart disease. So because they've kind of hit a ceiling finding rare variants, remember I mentioned that 14%, some people say it's 20%. I don't really think that's true. And we can debate that, but I'll give it. I'll say maybe it's up to 20% can be you know, uh, explained by these rare variants. So now the geneticists are quite desperate to find other sources of genetic risk for autism. 
So what this particular study did is it said, hey, listen, we're looking at multiplex families. These are families with more than two kids. So maybe there's more common variation inherited from the parents than you would have in another kind of cohort. And, you know, basically, uh, basically the, the study came up very empty. I want to say that there were some very minor findings that I think were kind of blown up and overhyped, but it, it came up very, it found very little genetic difference between the children with autism and the children without autism. It did find that with, and it found that common variants really didn't, non-coding variants and common variants alone really it, it had no explanatory power. But what it did find is, when, is that when you had a child with a rare variant, i.e., I mean, this is something like you know, a genetic mutation that might cause some sort of syndrome, that they're more likely to exhibit you know, stronger autism traits if they have a background of what's called a higher polygenic risk score, which is com uh, basically putting all those common variants together and coming up with a number. I didn't explain it very well. Alicia is an absolute pro at, at explaining these things. But this study, I have to say, drove me crazy because it was sort of presented as, look, common and rare variants explain autism risk when it did nothing of the sort. And I really want to hear uh, from you, Alicia. I might be misreading it. I read it a couple months ago and I read it quickly. I might be misreading it. I would love to hear your take on things. So I think we absolutely agree that, that the field of genetics has gotten a lot of attention and a lot of research. Um, in fact, I mentioned the year 2005 when I first started at the at NAR and we were looking for scientists, we're looking for the gene. So they thought that it was going to be one gene, like it was gonna be Huntington's disease or BRCA with breast cancer, that there was going to be a gene. Well, now we know that, or scientists know that that's not the case, that in fact, there's hundreds of genes and mutations in, in these hundreds of genes really, really push you towards a di to an autism diagnosis, but not always. So you can have, you can be someone with one of these genetic mutations and have a neurodevelopmental disorder likely, but it may not be autism. It could be language delay. It could be, um, you know, it could be motor coordination problems. It could be seizures plus other things. Um, and certainly when you see rare genetic disorders like Angelman syndrome and um, Phelan McDermott syndrome and DUP15Q and Fragile X, like not all of them are diagnosed with autism, but all of them probably have a neurodevelopmental disorder. So those is that, those are those 14% and uh, you acknowledged it, the numbers range, the numbers range based on what type of genetic test was done and what population you looked into. Um, so that's completely, you know, there's probably variance there, but in those cases, these genes also work in ways that you would expect to disrupt brain development. So I actually have no doubt that the, the mutation of these genes, whether it's 14 or 20% or whatever, is highly likely to cause an autism diagnosis. I had no doubt about that. The common variants, the number is, so these are like, if you have, and I think of it as a bucket sometimes. So like if you have three common variants, then that lowers the, the weight down, right? But maybe not all the way or fills the bucket. So maybe it fills the bucket halfway. If you have six, it fills it three quarters of the way. Um, if you have 10, maybe you have, um, you might have autism. Doesn't mean it's because of those common variants. Probably is because other people with these 10 common variants have autism too. Um, but it, it, it's but not we don't see always that. I mean, this is hypothetical. Right. This, this is, is hypothetical. hypothetical, right? This is hypothetical. So yeah. that is it. But the theory had been that you had these people with rare variants, and then you had these people with common variants. And there was a lot of discussion about whether, you know, what the features were. So in fact, the people with the rare variants are more likely to have an intellectual disability, and they're more likely to have medical issues like seizures, not always but just probabilistically they are compared to those that have common variants. So but obviously- who are those? who are those that have common variants? 
that are causing autism. There's not one person on the planet identified as having autism because of common variants. So again, you're right. It's a risk score. So it's not a yes or no. It's a polygenic risk score, which means you get- There is not one person on the planet who is identified as having autism because of a polygenic risk score alone. That's true. That yeah. is true. That it's a combination of multi multiple different things. But I think that you and I agree on many aspects. I think, and maybe this is because it's the sciency in me, where I am- I've always seen this dichotomy in the scientific literature. Oh, rare variants or common variants, right? So mm -hmm. rare, you know, so the, you know, people with rare variants, this, or this is a rare variant, or this is a de novo variant, which means neither parent has it, but the child has it. And, um, or common variants, right? Um, and people with common variants and autism tend to be this or this. And there was this dichotomy. And in fact, there really doesn't need to be this dichotomy because, people with these rare genetic vari the rare ones tend to have more common ones. So I think that you and I agree, in fact, that this common risk variant is this very ambiguous, you know, I used to call it Skinner's black box, but then, you know, they had the Simpsons where they had their own black box where the stuff went in and then something happened in the box and then something came out. So, you know, it's this black box where you really don't know what's going on. There hasn't been a person documented because of common variation, but I feel like there's enough evidence in the literature and the science to say that there is a risk. And again, we can call it a risk and say that you have all this common variation and that just fills your bucket a little bit more. And what tops your bucket off, that is yet to be determined. It could in fact be a rare variant. I think I, I describe this as being like, okay, a rare variant is a score of 70 and a common variant is a score of five. If you have a rare variant, you put that in the bucket and it weighs it really down and then you may add some common variants on. This is again, a hypothetical relationship. You're absolutely right. But I think that it was striking because for so long, you've been reading about the role of common variants, and a lot of people have purported that, you know, autism is in fact part of the, you know, broader state of, of diversity across the spectrum because common variants are involved in exactly. autism. Exactly. Um, but, you know, it, it, it's not as defined as, as rare variants are. So, okay. I would I, go much further than you. I mean, again, we'll have to okay. res respectfully only yeah, kind yeah. of sort of disagree. The, we've been talking about finding common variants in autism to explain the missing heritability of autism now for many years. There have been many studies looking for these common variants. We are not finding them. You know, this study was pretty high powered, a pretty, you know, big cohort. And all mm -hmm. it could do is explain a little tiny bit of the risk for autism in some of the offspring that had already autism explained by the de novo, by the de novo, their de novo rare mutations. I mean, and nothing else really. So I, you know, here's my thing. I mean, you know, I'm obviously a non-genetic inheritance person, as you well know, Alicia. <laughs> and but I guess no, I, that, that's, that's, like, yeah. I make no, no I, I, I don't hide that. And I guess what makes me so frustrated is that the geneticists make a presumption that's not a biological presumption. It's just sort of a, a theoretical presumption that autism, autism's heritability has to be from common or rare, or rare variants, period. And that there's no other source of heritability. There's nothing else that can be influencing autism risk. That's it. They have two variables in their bucket period. And this, I think, is an incredibly dangerous, you know, wrongheaded and non-biological, you know, approach to autism research. And I think that this particular um, study, and if you read the paper, you, all you have to do is read the first couple of paragraphs to see, you know, is uh, unfortunately um, a very, sorry, my phone's ringing, um, unfortunately really emblematic of, I think, this highly oversimplistic way of thinking about autism risk. You know, there, it doesn't even enter into the minds of these researchers that there could be something else going on molecularly, on a molecular level, but not on a genetic level, genomic level, that could be influencing risk. So, you know, I'm obviously an epigenetics person. I'm a chromatin person. 
you know, I'm a whole cell <laughs> person. And, um, and, you know, it just drives me nuts that we're just throwing more and more millions and millions and millions of dollars at these same questions over and over again, finding virtually nothing, right? And saying, well, you know, the rest is common variation that we just haven't found until we have a cohort of at least 200,000 um, yeah. subjects, <laughs> which is like it's patently absurd. It's also patently absurd to think that kids like mine have autism, multiplex family, because of common variants. That's absurd. How could, how could this severe, absolutely devastating mental disability arise from common variants? There's no explanation remotely close to it. So anyway, you know, I had, I, I said to Alicia, we have to talk about this genetics paper. It drives me nuts. <laughs> well, I do. <laughs> I mean, I can, we can a thousand percent agree that the etiology of autism is much more complex than common variation or rare variation. And you see this even in families who have a rare genetic variant, right? So there is a huge amount of diversity in terms of their feature and symptom presentation. So even with a known rare genetic variant, not all of those people are the same. And so clearly there's something more sophisticated about the etiology of autism, that it's one gene or even a hundred genes or even just genes, right? So mm -hmm. I absolutely a thousand percent agree that, you know, it, 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 the genetics part, I will say, has been able to be studied more, right? So we now have whole genome sequencing. This mm -hmm. was done with whole genome sequencing. Yes. We didn't have that before. What we need is to have that for, you know, multiple fat. We need a whole genome sequencer for things in the environment, contextual factors, um, other biological mechanisms that are going on that are not driven entirely by, you know, DNA, rather they can be driven. And so I know that some of the epigenetic kind of assays are becoming more and more sophisticated and absolutely those should be employed as well um, because those, those genes are kind of represented, but the way that they are mechanistically, the way that they are activated or turned on or turned off, it hasn't really been well described. So, um, you know, I absolutely agree yeah, and but, can also see how the field of genetics has been able to move forward faster than other fields. Well, they have, they have the tools. It's very easy. You don't have to really know anything about the background or history of the families. All you have to do is look at their, you know, their DNA. And, um, yeah. you know, there's, uh, that's a lot easier than, than looking at other, other mechanisms. I agree. But, you know, nevertheless, you know, we have this real problem. The last author of this paper, which by the way, was called the contributions of rare inherited and polygenic risk to ASD in multiplex families. Um, published in PNAS. Um, the first author yes. is Matilde Cernigliaro. <laughs> and um, the last author is Daniel Geschwind, um, who's probably one of the best known autism researchers on the planet. He's at UCLA. He's both a geneticist and a neuroscientist, and he's very widely published. Um, but if you listen to Dan Geschwind, and I'm sorry that I have to go on a Dan Geschwind rant, but it's my podcast, so I'm allowed. Yeah. If you listen to Dan Geschwind, I encourage you guys to go on YouTube. Maybe I'll put some in the show notes. Talk about autism risk. He will talk, like he's such a fan of this idea that common, undetected common variation is driving autism risk. And he will get, he, in his lectures, he will say emphatically that autism is just a variation along the continuum of normal human diversity, period. Mm -hmm. He does not talk about it as a pathology. Obviously, I think he would with, reg with regards to the de novo mutations. Um, he doesn't talk about it as something increasing in prevalence or where there's you know, a, a, you know, external factors that may be increasing risk to him. And he says this emphatically to his audiences Autism is just a natural variation on the continuum of human diversity. And that to me is flabbergastingly dangerous, incredibly wrong. And he is here he is probably the most influential figure in autism. And he is basically saying, we don't have a problem here. All we're doing is noticing common variation. That is what he is saying. 
the negative influence of this man on autism research, I think we cannot begin to understand. And I think that's part of the reason this paper drove me nuts because I think it sends all the wrong signals. It has the right, I'm not questioning its data, its data is fine, but what the conclusions that it's drawn, that are drawn are very much based on these erroneous assumptions about common variations. So anyway, I won't belabor it. We have three other things to talk about. Yes, <laughs> but yes. We, we, ha we have to talk about autism as a huge Dan Geshwin problem. And I think I'm going to do an entire episode called Autism has a huge Dan Geshwin problem because I have to excerpt these things that he says. I have to show you what is being communicated in the academic sphere, what he's telling students. It's utter BS and it's very dangerous. Okay. So I will admit I had not seen that. I have seen him give lectures about, and one of the things that he's contributed along with a number of other people has been how these genes interact with each other. So the genes by themselves, when you say there's a hundred and some, hundred and whatever risk genes for autism, they don't all act independently. They interact with each other. And um, he is this, um, and I'm not going to deny anything that's been on a video, but, uh, you know, that has been his, what I see as a major contribution is he looks at how the genes interact with each other um, and how they um, emerge and then also again how, how they can influence the effects of other genes but um, anyway we can that. we don't yeah, have to keep and I've seen this pathway papers but still when you look at the absolute population of autism his findings explain a very very small portion of autisms right and that's fine I'm glad I'm glad you found that gene I'm glad you found that interaction yeah it still explains on an absolute level a tiny fraction we are leaving behind 80 to 85% of autisms right now. We're still not finding anything about what's causing them, like my kids, like your daughter. We're not finding yeah. that. And we're looking at the same places over and over and over again. And I, I think it's just, uh, you know, it's, it's a scientific dead end and it's a real disservice to public health and the needs of, of families and our community. So, okay, I've ranted. I'm honestly not going to talk anymore because the other three okay. things, Alicia <laughs> has the floor. Let's talk about uh, uh, some scientific update. Uh, we're talking about prevalence, early intervention, and TikTok. Let's start with prevalence. So, you know, the CDC, which is the number counting agency for autism in the United States. Um, again, this is in the United States, although typically what happens is the world kind of follows. Um, put the prevalence at one in 36. So the last time a report was released, the number was in the 40s. This number is now in the 30s. So um, this means uh, many different things. But one of the things that it means is that there is one in 36 people with an autism diagnosis that um, most likely are not getting even one tenth of the services that they need. I mean, I don't know one family that gets everything that they need without hiring lawyers and jumping through hoops and um, fighting with insurance providers and, um, you know, doing all those things. Mm -hmm. So it's now at one in 36 documented cases where that one in 36 is coming from. Um, you know, there's been some changes. Um, you know, I'm thinking about whether or not we're detecting more of the cognitively abled communities over the years. I think that was the case for some prevalence years. This year, compared to the last time they counted, there really wasn't a huge difference. Um, but we are getting better. Scientists or, or, or epidemiologists or clinicians are actually getting better, which is good news about detecting Black individuals with autism and Hispanic individuals with autism. So for the first time ever, the prevalence in those communities was higher than white children. And don't let me confuse anyone. That does not mean that Black and Hispanic families have a higher risk for autism or that white families have a lower risk. Traditionally, then that was reversed, that in fact, Black and Hispanic families were less likely to get a diagnosis. Didn't mean they protected in any way, meant that we, we just weren't finding them. And I think 
many, many years of being very aggressive. And you and I talked about, you know, really having to focus in on families that are under research under and underrepresented black and Hispanic families were, were, you know, right on the top of that list. And so, um, that was, I think one of the better, some of the better news that in fact, you know, we don't know what's going to go forward. It could be a blip, I'm not saying it's not a blip. I'm hoping it's not a blip. If you look at the numbers over the years, they've been subtly increasing till finally, you know, now they're equal or greater to the prevalence in whites, but, um, so it didn't just happen, but let's see where we are in the next count. So for me, I was like, oh, fine, you know, thank goodness, finally. But there's this part of the increase in prevalence, and there is an increase in prevalence. That's not under debate. But, you know, there's still this unknown about what's causing the increase in prevalence, right? So, you know, there are people that believe that it's completely diagnostic substitution or it's completely diagnostic changes in the diagnostic. Um, you know, the way that ASD has been diagnosed from DSM-3 to DSM-4, now to DSM-5. Um, there are people that believe that, um, or who have data that things like, you know, societal supports increases. If you live in a neighborhood that has um, a higher density of people with autism, you're more likely to get diagnosed. And all of those things can be true. And it can also be true that there are actually, in fact, more cases of autism than has been seen in previous years, and that that increase in the numbers is real. So I don't want anyone to walk away and think that the matter is all settled. You can believe that there is a true increase in prevalence, and you can also believe that, or there is, but that is coming from more people with autism than there were. And you can also believe that some of it is caused by, you know, the fact that we're diagnosing differently, or you know, there are, uh, there's better awareness about the services that are available. So I don't want people to think that it has to be an all or nothing thing, that there can be multiple explanations. And one of the explanations can be that there is, there are more people with autism. And I know you have a lot to say about that. So I certainly do. I told, I just told you, I'm going to keep my mouth shut for the rest of the podcast. No, no. And I don't want you to, because I think you, you know, you have access to data in California that I think is very compelling. I hear a lot of people, though, again, same thing with the whole genetic argument, it has to be this or this. I hear people say, oh, well, it can't be this because it's all this. It's, you know, the way that we're labeling now what was previously called intellectual disability and that more, that's actually not always within the, always seen in the data. But as we, you know, decrease the number of people with intellectual disability, more people with autism are getting diagnosed. That could be part of it. It's certainly some part of it, but doesn't explain all of it. It could be that we're getting better, better at identifying some of the more subtle features of autism and that, um, you know, as the DSM has evolved, that those, those definitions have changed. But it could also be that there is also an in, more people with autism are, um, you know, that there are more people with autism in the community. Uh, yeah, I, I obviously have very strong feelings about this. <laughs> I've written, uh, I've spoken extensively yeah. about, about prevalence. Um, you know, uh, if you look at the, you know, case, or, I'm sorry, the prevalence by intellectual level, by IQ level, you, know, you see dramatic increases even among, you know, the IQ level that's considered intellectually disabled and the IQ level that's considered borderline intellectual disability. Mm -hmm. These people would not have been missed before. Mm -hmm. They just wouldn't have, period. End of story. You also see in the data, at least the data that I have seen, both in California, New York, some national data, you see a flatlining of intellectual disability. Sometimes you see a little increase in intellectual disability. You do not see any evidence that a decline in intellectual disability cases are explaining the increase in autism cases. You're not seeing that even in education data. So, um, you know, to me, that just, the, the data is not there. People talk about this, but it, you can talk about it all you want, but if you don't have evidence to support you, you know, we should put those hypotheses aside, you know, and move on. Now, for those uh, with what is called, you know, kind of normal IQ, IQs 85 and above, um, yes, I mean, I can imagine that there is some greater ascertainment now than there was before. But what we're also seeing, um, and we've seen this from 
you know, a couple of New Jersey studies is that we're still missing a lot of cases despite, you know, now reaching one in 36, that doesn't explain that that doesn't even reach, you know, the the true prevalence of autism because these studies are finding a significant, you know, um, population of missed cases. And I think, I know a lot of these um, young adults, I see a lot of these teenagers, they're intellectually okay, but they're socially ill-equipped. Mm -hmm. um, they're emotionally ill-equipped. Mm -hmm. They're immature for their age. Um, they often have trouble functioning, you know, launching, right? They're leaving the nest, you know, adulting. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they're often very isolated and lonely. They have trouble getting a job sometimes. I, I know a lot of these people who are on that margin, right? They're on that margin. And maybe they're in, maybe they're out of autism. Yeah, there's probably some uh, vari variability there where maybe there's a greater extent of prevalence because of them. But you know, when you look at those with lower IQs, it, it's just beyond dispute that that group has increased dramatically. And in California, in our, uh, of course, our DDS data, which are our Department of Developmental Services data, which is looking at those who are Medicaid eligible, i.e. they have very significant developmental disabilities, which render them eligible for Medicaid, um, you know, that has increased 50 fold, that the caseload has increased 50 fold over 30 years, 50 fold. For every one person with autism, yeah. about 35 years ago, there are now 50 people with autism. This is a massive expansion in our autism and DD population. Well, you know, that's another thing. I mean, now we're at one in 36. So how much, you know, what, what, what is going to be the number? What is the true number? We don't know. I don't, I don't mm -hmm. know if it's one in 36. It could change the next time that the CDC does a, a, an analysis, right? So, um, you know, it could go even higher than one in 36. It could stay at one in 36 for a few years. So, you know, I think that it's an ever, I, you know, you only hope that people who have a diagnosis that need, a, you know, who have autism, who need a diagnosis are getting that diagnosis. I don't know if that's happening. And then again, all the places in the United States, there's, there's variability. And I live in New Jersey, so I live in one of the higher states, but even California mm -hmm. surpassed New Jersey, which I, in the last number. So there yeah. is some variability in the states. Yeah, but California um, was just a uh, Northern San Diego County. So <laughs> yeah, no, and <laughs> that's to be another, careful. you know, yeah. Another, so I, I just, I, I, I don't know if this is the final number, and and I don't yeah. think we'll know either until the next number comes out. But um, this was a this was a pretty big jump from last year, which was in the forties. So now we're in the thirties now. Yeah. So well, ultimately, you know, if it's true, and I think it is true that probably about one in thirty six, um, eight year olds have have autism. Um, the implications for social services are beyond mm -hmm. comprehension. Yeah, we're not, I don't think we're fully absorbing what that really means for us. No, and, and I know that, really that the means for society. systems are not, are not set up for this at all. You know, if I, if I looked at the, the, and my daughter's in a mainstream classroom, so I looked at her class and I would say, you know, and if I said, okay, four of the kids have autism, they're not, they're not even prepared for the one, you know, in my mm -hmm. school system, in, in that, in that particular class. There are certainly other kids with different developmental disorders, but they're not even mm -hmm. prepared for the one. So how are they going to handle four in each class and then three or four cl classes or groups, eight grades per, they're, they're just not set up for it. Um, and that's something I don't even know if they're preparing. I mean, it's, you know, just like a lot of us, we just do our best with our kids and then hope that, you know, whatever action we've taken has helped the next person down the road. But I, I don't know who's looking at the bigger picture in the school system, at least. Uh, yeah, well, um, they're certainly not looking at the bigger picture when it comes to Medicaid and adult services. That's for sure. Yeah. You know, it's more like yeah. ah, blinders on maybe or maybe we believe Dan Geshwin. We don't have a problem because this is all natural variation. That's always been here. and We're just noticing it. If that's the case then we don't have to change a thing in policy. We don't have to expand housing. We don't need more 
direct service providers. We don't need more day programs. We don't need more employment programs. We don't need more crisis centers. We don't need more inpatient units because it's always been here. It's just natural variation, right? Yeah. I mean, these things have consequences. These ideas have consequences. These numbers have consequences. You know, and I do feel like we are ignoring reality. Okay, let's move to number two because I guess I'm done ranting. Yeah. Early intervention, Alicia. So, you know, one of the questions has always been, we do know that early intervention is effective and we know it from different studies, right? So, and this can be early intervention. I mean, people always think of it as sitting in a speech, you know, a speech and language pathologist office doing rote, which work by the way, but doing some of these speech and language tasks. It can be applied behavioral analysis. It can be all of these different things given as early as possible and supported as early as possible, we've seen multiple studies show an improvement in trajectories. So maybe it doesn't so-called change an autism diagnosis, but it can do things like improve social communication. It can um, uh, alleviate some repetitive and restrictive behaviors. And in some cases, it's been shown to improve cognitive abilities, not all of them, but some of them. So we know that this is an important thing that all children with autism, and frankly, it's my belief that everyone should have access to some of these services. I don't know if that's feasible, but um, that 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 it works. What hadn't been really established until this year was whether or not the earlier the better, right? So that had always been kind of presumed the earlier the better, but places like the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force, which makes recommendations about whether kids should get screened and supported at earlier ages, didn't see the distinction in that. So over the past six years, a group of individuals led um, by Whitney Guthrie, who was at Florida State and is now at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, had been looking at this question. So they had enrolled kids at either 18 months and given them these um, uh, they had been enrolled at 18 months, but they had done a different intervention at 18 months to 24 months or 24 months on. So they looked at whether or not that active, you know, dedicated either a parent or a parent clinician starting at 18 months versus 24 months was going to make a difference. And in fact, it did make a difference. And of course, it didn't make a difference in the number of like autism cases, but it did improve social and emotional abilities um, and uh, it improved reciprocal interactions and social and recognition of social cues and even social things like social cognition. So the end result is, and they used a randomized control trial, which means it was scientifically stringent. It wasn't that they just willy nilly kind of put people in one group or another. And they found that the ones at 18 months did better. And so I think that this really is the study that shows that we should be continuing to provide early intervention for kids. And even the CDC will say we're not as a whole, as a country, being able to diagnose them or get them into services. I mean, it's still hovering around the age of four to five, which is these studies are looking at 18 months making a difference for early intervention. So we really need to get kids evaluated earlier. And there's actually a new fresh off the press this week a new tool to objectively look at um, the way that infants and toddlers look at things in their environment as a way to diagnose autism. So this is kind of a breakthrough, but this can be used as young as 16 months. So if we can get every child into a clinic and have them tested at their eight, 16 to 18 month well baby visit and get them into early intervention as soon as possible, that is going to make a difference. And so I think that um, you know, a number of different accomplishments this year, including the study that just came out of, of Emory, which I know we won't talk about it too much, but for years, there's been a lot of this research on eye tracking and where infants look. And, you know, a lot of families, and rightly so, were thinking, you know, who really cares about this? Who cares where my child looks? Or, you know, here's another eye tracking study. What is it going to show? What is it going to do? Well, now there is a FDA approved device that you bring your child to a pediatrician, you put them in this device, they non-invasively track where the eye movements go and they can predict autism accurately 90% of the time. So that's as good as you know the observational diagnosis. So not to drop the observational diagnosis because that's something that 
still, we need that. We need clinicians. We need those observations, but this could potentially be a way to get kids into early intervention faster, which seems to work. And again, we're not talking about autism, no autism. We're talking about their functioning across their lives. You talked about, you know, those who are nonverbal or those who, you know, are versus those who are, you know, intellectually, you know, are just a little bit socially awkward. Maybe that can be helped um, and supported. So I think this was kind of a big year so far for promoting early intervention and, you know, kind of tweaking it and, and making it more effective. I'd like to put it in the show notes. And I, I haven't actually read that paper. Um, what do you remember the first author or the title of the paper? Yeah. So the first author, and I can email it to you. Okay. The first author is Whitney Guthrie, G-U-T-H-R-I-E. Okay. And she worked with um, Amy Weatherby. Um, she worked with Kathy Lord. And the top, the title of the paper is The Earlier the Better, an RCT, which stands for Randomized Control Trial of Treatment Timing Effects for Toddlers on the Autism Spectrum. So it came out um, in 2023. And so they you know, were able to recruit, then they did the intervention, and then they, they looked at the outcome. So this is the study several years in the making. Um, and it was really, really well needed. I mean, you would be surprised at how many regulatory agencies or agencies that have the ability to make changes in services have been, have said, there's just no evidence. There's just no evidence. There's no evidence that earlier is better. Mm -hmm. um, there's no evidence that says that screening promotes earlier intervention. So um, scientists are going back and well, doing you those also studies. see these diminished expectations as well in that no one's looking for um, ex an exit from the autism diagnosis. They're looking for an amelioration of symptoms. Yeah. Right. So before the metric was more like, oh, can you get them off the autism spectrum? Now the metric yeah, is, yeah. you know, can you improve their social score? Um, and there was another study. Remember the the preemptive study from Australia, like last year, kind of Western Australia. Yeah, that was so. I don't know why that was, it got, it was controversial on Twitter, but who, that doesn't mean anything <laughs> to me. Um, but it, this was an intervention that was actually adapted. So it started in the UK um, and then it was tried out in Australia, you know, which is all and good. Really young you kids. These were like- Really young kids, yeah. six, I mean, six months really. Yeah. And these were kids that had a high likelihood or a high risk of a autism diagnosis. And the intervention was not, I mean, the intervention was sitting there and reading with your child and, and parents like, I mean, I know when I started reading to my kids, I was like, do I use different voice? I mean, I didn't know how to do this, uh, you know, and what would be most engaging. And I didn't know to stop and let them look at the paper, the book, and then look at them and then meet, I didn't know any of this. So this is an intervention that does that, you know, supports parents because parents are the ones that spend, or some caregiver are the ones that spend the most time with their 16 or their six month old to their 12 month old to even their, whenever they go on to preschool. So this is a very early intervention that wasn't doing things like sending brain waves in or, or planting electrodes. This was something that was, you know, basically supporting children's learning and it had very positive effects. Um, and it became very controversial and I don't know why, but that's Twitter for you. Well, yeah, I read that paper when it came out. I have to say my response to it, my knee-jerk response, which is not necessarily science, <laughs> but response was, you know, if you have a kid with autism, that kid is not going to sit around and be read to. That kid is not going to sit around and be played with. You know, that kid is not going to be, you know, uh, you know, quiet, quietly and docilely, you know, hanging out with mom. Um, you know, it's the kids who are less likely to have autism who are more likely to engage. And so I felt that, and I didn't feel the study design adequately really controlled for that. So you're, you're designed to fail. Like if I had sat down with my son, Johnny, at six months to read a book, it wouldn't have lasted more than two seconds. Yeah. I guarantee you not more than two seconds. He had zero attention, zero ability to relate or do any back and forth with me at all, which by the way, continues to this day and he's 24. So, <laughs> so I kind of read that and I'm like, are you really thinking, did you, did you consider that in your conclusions? But anyway, 
That's no, I will say, and just going back to Amy Weatherby, I mean, she has a program, it's called the Autism Navigator. And frankly, this program sees all sorts of different kids at really young ages. And the program, excuse me, really works on meeting those kids where they are. And I'm not saying any of these, I mean, I wish they were all it, right? But in fact, what we're seeing is that, you know, they can do things like improve social interaction or social cognition or reduce some repetitive behaviors or allow kids to have greater attention spans um, or, you know, control impulsive a little bit, but they're not the be all end all that's going to, you know, eliminate every behavior. But at I, the same time, yeah. they, you can kind of meet your child where they are. And of course, these things don't work the same in every individual. So the effect sizes are not going to be huge. So that's where I really think where when we talk about interventions going forward, we really need to be focusing on, you know, maybe subgrouping people with autism a little bit differently, because if you put everybody in a big bucket, you're going to be, see, you're going to, you know, this one's going to respond and this one's going to respond. This one's not going to respond. And then you're, you're just going to wash it out. But on the, and sorry, going back to Amy's, she has this autism navigator and she literally has clinicians go through and she trains other clinicians and other service providers and parents to kind of deal with particular situations as they come up and they can be, um, you know, eye gaze, it can be um, speech, it could be all these things. And so you see these kids on all different areas of the spectrum and they don't get like clinicians have to kind of adapt what they do and they have to teach parents to adapt what they're doing based on each individual child. So that's my push and that's my plug for making sure that we're not just lumping everyone with autism together, um, that we have some way of separating them out into groups because one type of support is not gonna work for every single person. That hopefully is the future of autism research, especially yeah. intervention research, early intervention research or uh, later intervention research we need more and more disaggregating of this autism yeah. thing, you know, and I'm very concerned about the self-fulfilling prophecy, uh, in, you know, affecting the results in, in some of these early intervention studies. Um, you know, that, you know, when you, when you have a kid who's more likely to engage, well, that's the kid who's going to have the better trajectory in the first place, you know, and that's the kid who's going to have more hours, right. Of intervention because they're able to engage anyway, neither here nor there, but, um, uh, you know, it's a, it's a good paper. I will have to read it and I will put it in the show notes. Finally, first of all, I want to congratulate any listener who stuck it out <laughs> this long. <laughs> this is one yes. of the longer podcasts with us going discursively about um, various uh, themes in autism research. So congratulations. We are at our last leg. <laughs> yes. Thank um, you. And this is certainly not a TikTok video, uh, yes. which brings you, bring us <laughs> to our last topic, which is the use of TikTok in helping to diagnose autism. And so, and I apologize, I would never mow my own lawn and someone is now mowing our lawn and- It's okay, I don't, I don't hear it. Um, but uh, so, you know, I had, I had reported back earlier this year about this phenomenon that was happening around TikTok and neurologists had been noticing it that during the pandemic, these mostly girls, I'm not saying they're all girls, but mostly girls were coming to psychiatrist's office with these tick disorders. And, um, you know, the more that some of these psychiatrists delved into it and, you know, you know, what, what, you know, what do you feel when you have the tick and, and, and really looked at it, they realized that some of these tick disorders were actually the result of girls watching TikToks of other girls have who have Tourette's syndrome and whether they were consciously or unconsciously mimicking some of these tics, they were actually mimicking, mimicking the tics. Um, and so they, they still have the tics. They're being treated as they, you know, as someone with a tic disorder and they should be, but how on earth could, could TikTok create tics? And in fact, if you, you know, watch something enough times and believe that you have, that you actually might have a tic disorder, you can psychologically kind of psych yourself into it. Now, I have seen a lot of TikToks on, the reason I'm on TikTok is my one daughter's on TikTok all the time and I have to <laughs> monitor it. But um, I have seen a lot of TikToks with the hashtag autism. 
And there have been a lot of concerns about, okay, people getting on TikTok saying they have autism, this is their own experience, or I have autism and this is what autism looks like. And then having healthcare providers get on TikTok themselves because now t TikTok is all over the place. Um, billions and billions of people can watch a particular TikTok video. Um, and a, a group at Drexel University that was actually led by two undergraduates um, and then also some lead senior investigators to help them through it went through some of the TikTok videos that um, got the most hits. So they could actually monitor this and however many people watch this video. And they narrowed it down to a group of 100 or so videos that got like billions of hits. I mean, it was just this because, you know, they're, they're a few seconds long. People watch them, they swipe right through them. And they categorize them as just anecdotal, which means I have autism and this is how I experience the world. Okay, those weren't involved in the study. They were categorized differently. Then they had people who were sharing their own experiences they were personal experiences, but instead of saying, I have this experience, they were saying, well, this is what people with autism experience. And then they had another group that was healthcare providers providing information about like, you know, like this podcast, like what's the prevalence and, um, you know, what are some of the features and what are some of the struggles and how to support those with autism. And wouldn't you know it, the ones from the healthcare providers were the most accurate, but Shocking. the ones- from the but the ones that they were watched in equal amount of times so as many people were clicking or watching or whatever the ones that were accurate versus the ones that were inaccurate now whether or not this in itself can be linked to any sort of change in diagnosis or even a case of a diagnosis we don't know one of the arguments when i when i reported this study was that some people don't have access to a diagnosis so they are forced into a situation where they have to watch a TikTok video to get a diagnosis. And my response would be that diagnosis is garbage if you're getting it from TikTok. Mm -hmm. And I realize that there are long waiting lists and I know that this is the case. And, you know, but you cannot, and I sympathize, but you cannot watch a TikTok video and diagnose yourself with autism. It's just not, it's just not how it's, it's not just how it's done. You could be cheating yourself out of the wrong, the right diagnosis. You could be having something, you know, not really, you know, autism spectrum ish, but not necessarily autism. You know, a lot of these things kind of overlap and that includes OCD and ADHD and you could be misdiagnosing yourself. And so I think that it's incredibly dangerous that you're having two groups of videos. One is accurate mostly for the most part and one is inaccurate. And then they're both being watched at the same, um, same levels. So as much yeah, it's inaccurate. not like you know these things accurate. are vetted or filtered or juried no. on TikTok. Anyone can no. say, or on any social media platform, right? But it, I mean, there are many dangers to it. It's not just this self-diagnosis phenomenon. I mean, it's just this inaccurate portrayal of what autism is, right? You yeah. just see so much, you know, um, autism as identity stuff on TikTok. I mean, not that I'm on TikTok, but people send me videos. So I do see some of them. Um, yeah, I but normally a watch lot like of them are autism. Videos. I'm sorry. Oh, I normally watch like cat videos and yeah. stuff like that on TikTok <laughs> or whatever the girls are looking at. I have to keep an eye on, but I mean, I, I agree. And I think that, um, you know, another issue and I, so one of the, one of the people on this paper had explained this to me. So if you watch a video, right? So it's almost like a you're, you're on a hamster wheel a little bit. If you watch and spend time watching one video, there's an algorithm that will feed you more videos like that. So mm -hmm. if there oh, are yeah. a lot of, of people watching one particular video, which may have a lot of information on it, and it gets a lot of likes or it gets a lot of watches, then it gets put into like, it, it, it gets put into a queue differently within TikTok as a highly watched video. And then also your preferences for what TikTok videos you want to watch. God, this is so boring. But what your preferences get <laughs> adapted so that you're seeing more of those same videos. So just watching the one misinformation video could spurn an avalanche of other misinformation. Yeah. Videos. 
Sorry, I know yeah. that wasn't very interesting. No, However, no, no, but that's true. I mean, this is it's, why it's, we, it's, we've it's a seen real that. problem with TikTok. But haven't we seen that with all the social media platforms, especially like politically? You know, it gets people kind of into their own little bubble, right? Where they're in their echo chamber, kind of, you know, just seeing mm -hmm. people who share their political views or, you know, their views on climate change or their views on transgenderism or whatever it is, right? And you're kind of locked in that bubble and that's all you see over and over. It's, and I think that's probably a similar phenomenon on, on TikTok, right? Yeah. You're, and, yeah. and, you know, I, I just think it's, um, uh, you know, there, there's so much romanticizing of autism and trivializing of autism and kind of characterizing autism as, you know, this, again, natural diver neurodiversity, neurodivergence. And again, these things are very, very dangerous. You know, these narratives can have dramatically negative consequences for people who are really suffering um, with autism and you know, real autism. And, um, you know, it, I, I can't put a number on it. I don't know the magnitude of this problem, but I do think we have a huge complacency problem when it comes to our kind of policy making, when it comes to kind of social change around autism. And I think that uh, that complacency is very much fed by myths um, peddled on social media. So I haven't read the paper yet, Alicia. I have to read it. <laughs> we will put it in the I show notes so it everyone will read it. Oh, wait, and didn't you do, I, you did an interview on your podcast. I did you? do an interview with the four authors. Um, and that's Diana up Aragon, already. Guevara, uh, Elizabeth Sheridan, Giacomo Vivanti. It's called The Reach and Accuracy of Information on Autism on TikTok. I so okay so i'll put that link so by the way i can, I know, can send you the paper and the and the um i'll take it i'll podcast. take the, heat, send me the paper and and the the yeah but um the other thing about to talk and you know i hate to keep harping on this but this is a platform that has promoted eating tide pods right so you know so tide yeah. pods you know the, the have you heard about that i had i had mm -hmm. to know about tide this pod this challenge right day. The Tide Pod Challenge. So you eat, literally eat a, a, a detergent packet and they promote this. They also recently, a, a kid, 15 year old, and again, this actually was on the news, but I, the autopsy hasn't been done yet. So I'm not going to make any assumptions, but he died after doing a TikTok challenge where you eat this chip. I had never heard about this before, but it's like one of these chips that has like ghost pepper and like all those really, really hot peppers on it and then you eat it and you can't drink any water or you can't like you just have to let it sit in your stomach and so again I can't guarantee that that's what he what this kid died from but on the other hand why are you eating a potato chip that is like whatever Scoville units when you watch these cooking shows and not drinking anything and I'm not I'm not excusing him for for falling for it but you know, this is not a platform where you should be taking any sort of medical advice. I mean, I just have to say that, you know, I, I know that sometimes yes. options are limited, Shopping, yeah. but you, you can't take <laughs> any advice from TikTok. Yeah. But, you know, if you're one of these, you know, or tweens or teens mm -hmm. or, you know, on, on TikTok, you know, you know, you might just take this stuff seriously. This becomes your version of autism. This becomes your belief about autism. It becomes your belief right? about autism. Right. Right. And it, right. and it, and, and it becomes kind of their, their reality. They aren't sitting there with highly critical thinking capacities, <laughs> you know, and questioning you know, what, what they're seeing. So I, I imagine that. Um, and again, this wasn't, so some people go on TikTok and it's almost like a therapy for them and they'll say, I have autism and this is my experience. That wasn't part of it. So they mm -hmm. actually coded those differently. These were people that were going on TikTok and talking about autism as if they were authorities because they themselves have autism and that makes you the authority of you not an authority on everyone on the spectrum so I think that's yeah. where the problem was specifically because I don't think anyone wants I mean you know as silly as I think TikTok is there may be something beneficial about different people sharing their own perspectives and um experiences as people with autism or ADHD or even other mental illnesses. I think there's a lot to be learned from that. But once you start saying, okay, I have autism and therefore this is the way the rest of the autism world 
experiences things, I think that that's very dangerous. Or you need to see this doctor, or you don't need to see this doctor, or this is normal, you know, gastrointestinal problems, that's fine. You know, everybody with autism has them. So just ignore them. That's not where we want to be. So well, this goes back to what we were just talking about in early intervention. I mean, we have an overgeneralization problem in autism. You know, we have this throwing too many things into the same bucket problem with autism. And, I add that and absolutely. And so some of these things, when you get to genetics, when you talk about diagnosis, when you even talk about, you know, biomarkers, we need to move towards a place where they're not just identifying autism, which is a good step because you have to do that step first before you think about subgroups of autism, but then thinking about subgroups of autism. And then, you know, I that's really hard to do in young kids, right? Because your experience and your, you know, things can happen during different trajectories that may alter that course. So you don't want to make too many predictions, but if you can make some predictions or make some assessments and group people according to their needs at the time, that can really, really make a huge difference in terms of what sorts of interventions are most supportive and helpful to them. Because there are people that receive interventions that don't work for them um, and they work for other people. And mm -hmm. I think it's time that we stop accepting that as being okay. And we move mm -hmm. towards, you know, the right, the, right, with the right support or mm -hmm. intervention or treatment for the right person at the right time. Thank you for saying that because um, as you know, my kids both went through early intervention and which did absolutely bupkis for them, except for maybe helping Johnny get toilet trained. And yeah. you know, I, I the amount of time and money that was wasted on their early intervention is just, uh, yeah, it, it's like medical malpractice in my opinion. Like we have to rein this in and figure out how to make things really meaningful for people. And also yeah. I think, as I like to say, some kids just aren't available for early intervention. They're just not. And so, you know, I think you have to really change the mindset to later in life intervention might be a better period for them. I don't know why, you know, we're so obsessed with, you know, this early developmental window. It might not be the right time. You know, it, it well, I do. Ag I want to say that that early intervention study did, and I don't want it to appear this way. So I'm being extra careful. It did not suggest that you sacrifice any sort of intervention for early intervention. Really, it says that early intervention earlier can help and does help better than later. But it doesn't mean, OK, if you get this intervention at 18 months, you're never going to need supports again. No, no, no. I, no, I didn't need... mean to. Of course well, not. Yeah. Course. So I just don't want that to be the, the and, and I know I just don't want anything to get misinterpreted because I don't want anyone mm -hmm. to ever think that it's too late to get intervention or it's too late to get supports that you need. It's absolutely not. Well, on that note, congratulations to everybody who hung in for this extraordinarily yes. long Thank you and so rambling much. podcast. You this know one. what? You get a treat if you, <laughs> Jill will share my email. If you want, if you email me and want the PDFs of those papers, I will send those to you for staying on. That's your prize. End. That's for my prize. <laughs> yeah. Don't, um, you know, don't spend it all in one place. Well, I'm always happy to talk um, research with you, even though we don't agree on every little tiny thing. Um, you know, I'm just so glad that you are around to monitor, um, you know, all these new developments and um, also on your podcast to bring these new developments to life. By the way, her podcast is called, I think, the Autism Science Foundation podcast. Yeah, the Dr. Autism Alicia Halliday. Science Foundation <laughs> weekly science podcast, podcast and it's on iTunes. And you know, yeah. know what? I'm glad, you know, it's good to disagree. I mean, we can respectfully disagree and see things differently. None of these advances would be happening if any everyone just agreed on everything, you know, like there wouldn't be yeah. this okay, what's next? Because it would all just be determined. So it's it's good to have a good respectful discussion. I agree. Respectful, yeah, so word here. thank you, Alicia. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you for having me. On I'm looking Monday. forward to it. Yeah. Okay. And um, yeah, shoot all me right. whatever you can for the show notes. Okay, I will. I'll do that later. I got to go. Yeah, the links. Okay. Yeah, go, <laughs> go, go, take, go take care okay, of your right. children. Right. <laughs> okay, adios. Okay. Right. Bye. Bye.